This is an, an age of disruption, of profound revolutionary change. What we're really asking ministers is to empower the ambassadors. The only thing that you really push forth is the truth. You don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic. And welcome back from lunch to the second part of Politico's Future of Food and Farming Summit. I'm Douglas Buzzfine, Politico's Agriculture and Food and Trade Editor. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. I certainly did. But for millions of people, a good, nutritious meal is becoming increasingly unaffordable. And that spells hunger for people in poorer countries and tough choices for even those, uh, those even in well-off countries in Europe, which brings us to the topic of our first, first uh, post-prandial panel, food affordability versus climate ambitions, finding the right balance. Now we've got the usual rigmarole to get through, uh, so I'd like to thank our partners for making this summit possible. Our leading partner is Bayer, our visibility partner is the European Council of Young Farmers. And a few housekeeping rules, as you've heard already, you can answer, ask questions through the Swapcard plat platform. Um, if you're in the room and can scan the QR code on the screens, otherwise check it, uh, the event instructions on the website. And if you're already on the platform, feel free to chat with fellow attendees and ask questions in the questions box to the right of the screen on the desktop and below the live stream if you're watching on your mobile. So, uh, yep, please tweet on X or the social media of your choice and our Twitter hashtag is Politico Agri Food. Um, right, I'll throw out some uh, introductory remarks just to just to get to set the scene. Good to see so many of you there. Um, from my editor chair, a few things have struck me over the year. I've been in the hot seat on agri and food at Politico. The shock resulting from Russia's war on Ukraine pandemic disruption to supply chains and more than a decade of easy money have all combined to force up food price inflation, which peaked at around 50% at the end of last year in Hungary, an EU member country. But the pain isn't felt equally across Europe. Food accounts for around 12% of consumer spending in countries like France, but it's more than double that or a quarter in countries where incomes are lower. At the same time, shifting to more sustainable and less intensive farming and food production methods isn't going to cut costs. Everyone knows when they go to the supermarket that they will pay more to buy organic produce. Big business, big agribusiness and its political allies have highlighted the rising costs as an argument to slow aspects of the EU's green transition. This morning we heard about the derogations to um, suspend some of the biodiversity rules applying to, uh, uh, to allow increased food production. Yes, but they have faced uh, criticism from those who argue that given the environmental and climate risks that we all face, we should be, if anything, going faster. So who is right? Well, to answer that, I'm delighted to welcome three great speakers to discuss this all and more. And I'd like to invite our guests in the room up onto the stage. First of all, welcome, if you can still hear me, I'd like to welcome Irene Tolleré. Irene is a French member of the European Parliament and she represents... Please make yourself comfortable. Welcome. Make yourself comfortable. Irene uh, represents the Renew uh, Europe group in the European Parliament. Also with us is Gabriela Heisler. Gabriela is Chief Executive Officer of Spa Hungary, uh, the, re the food retail group. And joining us by video link is uh, Giacomo Martino. Welcome, Head of Unit for Ecosystems One, uh, Chemicals Food Retail at DG Grow at the European Commission. Nice to see so many of you. As I say, we had the youth this morning, the talent 
moderating the panels, but it's now time for the experience. <laughs> so, uh, good. The, the first question uh, I'd like to um, turn to, um, to you, Irene, uh, with you're a wine grower. Um, you have represented voters both locally and in the European Parliament. You're a full member of the Regi Committee uh, in the European Parliament, but you're also active in Agri. You're also active in MP, MEP groups related to uh, wines and spirits, but also food. So you have a, a pretty unique perspective um, on the topic we're talking about, food affordability. What are your voters saying? What are your constituents saying? And what are farmers saying about the challenges they face today? Um, okay, so food affordability is a main concern for all our citizens. Uh, and we have new metrics since uh, the war of, uh, in Ukraine started because now we have uh, people who work, young couples who work with two salaries and young kids that have difficulties buying their food. So uh, it's a, a, a new uh, challenge uh, uh, for us uh, that this increase of uh, the, the, the food price uh, is, uh, is uh, creating. So that is something that we hear locally, but all, all over uh, the, the place. And then in terms of uh, uh, local uh, bodies or, or national uh, uh, government, it's a, a priority for the French government. A lot of fiscal measures have been put to try to reduce uh, the impact of the inflation on all the, uh, the, the, the French citizens. But uh, uh, the subject is a, should be a priority. Because I do not uh, believe that uh, for the next European elections, uh, people will believe in us if we are not able to deliver quickly on this subject. Uh, the, the fact of being able to feed oneself uh, with good products uh, is a, a fundamental right, and we should make sure that it is a, a fundamental right that is uh, in exercise. Thank you. Uh, turning to Gabriela, um, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, food price inflation in Hungary has been among the highest, if not the highest, in, uh, in the European Union. And this is either despite or even some would say because of some of the government's attempts to contain inflation by imposing cr price controls. I mean, how, does this, how hard does this make you, it for you to do your job to run a good viable commercial business while also uh, keeping your customers happy? It's extremely difficult because, as, as you mentioned, Hungary had the highest food inflation in Europe. At, at the peak, it was 50%. So at the last December, we reached 50% food inflation. And in August, it was only 195 so it's still still extremely high, and you ha we have that in a country where the average wage is 1,000 euros, uh, and out of that 1,000 euros, more than 20% goes on food. Uh, so it's an it's ex extreme challenge for our customers, and obviously the customers react, and how they they react, it's I believe uh, the same across Europe. So they switch to private label products uh, because these are more affordable, and the quality is also okay. They look for promotions, and they take promotions for granted. Because earlier, if you said, you know, uh, pay, uh, buy two, get three, all these promotions doesn't work anymore. Because they only have, uh, because they don't want to buy three, they want to buy only one. Because that's, uh, that's uh, what money is there for. So that's the, the environment, that's what the customers want from us. But as you mentioned earlier, there is also the Hungarian government. We have been living with the so-called price cap, which meant that the Hungarian government fixed the prices of eight, eight product groups. And it was uh, between February 2022 till this July. And since August, we have mandatory promotions. Um, uh, the real problem with that was uh, that we as retail, we, were all, we are also always blamed. So somehow, because the cons consumers come to our stores for all the inflation, it's only the retail which is built, uh, blamed, but a little bit different topic. I can elaborate on that a little bit later. But simply that's what's also in the head of, of the politicians. And they said, okay, a price kept, fixed price. 
so we were buying for uh, 100 and selling for 50. That cost us more than three to four million euros every single month. Uh, and that's quite a disaster. That's only our company. Uh, but it was uh, similar for all the international players in the, in the Hungarian market. Um, but actually, it didn't work. It didn't work because normally these kind of disruptions in a normal uh, economy don't work. Uh, the president of the Hungarian National Bank said that these measures were boosting inflation by 3 to 4 percent. And the reason why is probably easy to explain by uh, an example of milk. Uh, the full fat milk was priced kept. And with the price changes, a few months after it was introduced, actually full fat milk was cheaper than half fat milk, which led that a lot of uh, fat, milk fat was taken out from the market. So any other product like cream or whatever uh, got an extreme high price because the, the fat we sold in a, in a normal milk, which is simply nonsense. So it, it, uh, it led to a situation where exporting brie from France was cheaper than buying it in Hungary, which is also logistically, logistically a nonsense. It's probably good for the internal market, market. <laughs> but from a sustainability point of view, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so that's, th that's the situation. So yes, we have to tackle inflation. We have to make sure that the people can buy affordable product, but we have to make it in a, in a way which is uh, market comfort, comfort, conform, market conform, yes, I can say it that way. Thank you very much. Um, if I could turn to you, Giacomo, obviously we've heard about um, perhaps a fairly extreme but not unique um, situation in Hungary with um, some fairly heavy-handed price controls, but um, the bigger issue, I suppose, is um, you know around affordability. I think the retailer gets blamed, as um, Gabriella says. There's much talk in the media about gr so-called greedflation, food food retailers being accused of taking advantage of that inflationary environment to um, to uh, increase their margins. I mean. Is there any truth in that? And, and what's the right answer? Do you regulate? Do you intervene? Or is this something where you need to talk uh, and negotiate with them, um, with the retailers uh, to, to find the right, um, the right path forward? Well, th thank you. Thank you, Douglas. And uh, good afternoon. Uh, really very sorry for not being physically present uh, in Paris. Uh, I, I regret it. Uh, well, th thank you very much for the for the question, which is not, of course, a, a, an easy one. Uh, when, you know, we think about uh, for food affordability versus uh, climate conditions, um, well, there is no magic solution and the equation is not easy uh, to be found. So uh, let me maybe to, to address your, your immediate question say uh, certainly uh, regulatory or legislative intervention is certainly not the only solution uh, and, and a lot can be done also through uh, other instruments. But uh, uh, to feed the discussion, maybe let me suggest uh, and offer for, uh, you know, for thinking and for discussion some parameters that, in my opinion, uh, have, to be, have to be considered. So, uh, first of all, despite what we have heard, and uh, of course it's true, uh, COVID first and even more now uh, following the, the, you know, the, the war of aggression of, uh, of Russia against Ukraine, the parameters have, have changed. A lot of elements have changed and, and, and the, the food affordability is certainly much more prominent uh, than before. But however, globally, and if we compare that with our blocks around the world, uh, he, 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 I would say, and I think we don't have to forget that EU is far, you know, from uh, uh, having really, uh, I would say, a food security major problem. Uh, once again, don't misunderstand me. I don't want to uh, reduce the, the, the importance of food affordability, but let's say as a continent, we are far from having uh, food security problems despite, despite the tensions. On the other one, uh, let me say that in that, a role to play, it's uh, also played importantly uh, by the single market, after all, which is a, a big asset uh, to uh, somewhat act, I would say, as, a, a, you know, to reduce uh, the, the, the criticalities 
uh, that uh, can happen uh, in, in the agro food and in other, by the way, or of course also in other sectors. And, and the other parameter I would like to offer to your consideration is that overall, EU is a strong, uh, you know, a strong player at global level in agro food. We are very strong, actually, we are a, a net exporter uh, in the agri-food industrial ecosystem as a, a, as a whole. Uh, so, uh, you know, we shall keep that element as a strong element for Europe. So, having said that, of course, I have not come to solution, but I am ready to offer maybe in the following round some ideas. Uh, my, my service is working on uh, more, uh, I would say, more directly. Right now, uh, we are working on a document which will remain a policy document, so certainly not a regulatory instrument mm -hmm. on what we call a transition pathway for the agro-food ecosystem, uh, trying with all the stakeholders to find the right balance precisely between reaching uh, the digital and, and, and green uh, and, and resilience uh, um, you know, uh, transition uh, challenges. Uh, while at the same time uh, preserving, you know, all, all the good things that uh, have taken place uh, so far. And the other one, little contribution, I must say, but I would like to mention it uh, as, as an example, is also, uh, you know, what we have as the co Code of Conduct uh, for Responsible Food and Business uh, Practices, uh, which, uh, which is a, a voluntary instrument that we think can bring his piece of contribution in all this, uh, in addressing this difficult equation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Giacomo. I mean, I, I, I think um, you journalists will tend to see the glass as half empty and uh, someone with policy responsibility will, will take a more positive view. But uh, my strong takeaway from your comments was um, what is going right, not, as not, not what is going wrong. And I think, so I found your, uh, found your statement about the, um, the strengths of the in internal market coming into play uh, quite interesting and, um, and, and powerful. I mean, if you don't mind me staying, uh, are you calling the single market an asset? I mean, if you don't mind me, because I'm, you are responding to my original question uh, on the code of conduct. I mean, this applies. Are you talking to retailers, particular, talking about re retailers particularly? Can you expand on that and um, on the status of it, where where you're seeing um, where you're seeing uh, in, uh, participation, and what kind of results um, uh, uh, you can speak for on that? Yes, thank you. Uh, and, and indeed, maybe, um, you know, to, to jump back on the quite delicate single market element and dimension, it is true that we are assisting probably because of the overall context that we just, uh, I mean, that all us as three speakers we, we, we described. Uh, we are, of course, very vigilant because there is a plethora of initiatives mm. at national level. Uh, and and uh, I think that uh, Gabriella described some of them, but uh, I, I would say, you know, I, I, I don't want to point the finger to one specific country because uh, uh, all around Europe there are certain initiatives that we are following with particular attention, uh, you know, that, that can hamper, uh, even if starting with good intentions, I would say that that can hamper uh, really uh, the free market, being it in the agro-food uh, industry or in the retail uh, industry. But um, you asked me somewhat uh, to put the accent on the positive uh, on the positive element. Well, the code of conduct is one little example because it's part, of course, uh, uh, of the farm to fork uh, strategy. And the idea there, uh, you know, and and I was mentioning non-legislative measures. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's a, 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 a voluntary. Uh, uh, commitment uh, by stakeholders and in particular, of course, uh, by, by, by businesses to uh, increase the availability and affordability of healthy and sustainable uh, food, uh, food options. Uh, and and uh, basically to work together, shaping a path, uh, uh, you know, uh, towards uh, this uh, uh, aspirational, I would say, objective, overall objective uh, along, along the food chain. Mm -hmm. So basically, we have been developing this uh, uh, code of conduct uh, uh, as a co-creation uh, process, and it consists of two main elements, uh, seven aspirational uh, objectives with specific target and the list of indicative uh, actions, and the framework for pledges uh, with ambitious concrete uh, commitments 
so uh, you know this was launched actually this code of conduct uh, in uh, July 2021 and and we had uh, uh, we have so far uh, more than 130 businesses that have been uh, you know uh, subscribing uh, to the code of conduct it doesn't mean that they are buying or they are able uh, to achieve uh, all the uh, aspirational objective that has been set there but what is important is first of all awareness and of course this is not sufficient also commitment to do it maybe in order not to take too much time i would like to underline that our challenge right now in accompanying this process is to have in particular smes uh, you know because the, the big uh, the big players the big companies were not even waiting, let me say very frankly, for the code of conduct. They were already, uh, at least in one or the other aspects, uh, were already implementing some, uh, some, uh, you know, some of these uh, aspirational objectives. But uh, we really want SMEs, first of all, to know about it, and and secondly, of course, to commit uh, into uh, the major number uh, as they can of uh, of this aspirational objective so our efforts are concentrating right now on uh, on that thank you, thank you. I, I i think this brings us to uh, to you Irene, because i think uh, uh, we you know you're very much into the uh, uh, importance of uh, the availability and accessibility of a good quality food that there shouldn't be some kind of two speed yes. Two speed uh, Europe, where maybe if you can afford it, you can eat well, but if you can't uh, can't afford to eat uh, can't afford it, you don't eat well. I mean, how do you, could you pick up on Giacomo's comments there and share your thoughts um, in that direction? Uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, first of all, the causes of uh, this food infla inflation are bad news climate change and all the uh, climate catastrophes that put pressure on uh, our farmers and the aggression of U uh, Ukraine that has put a huge stress on the price of fertilizers and energy. And when it comes from very big and powerful negative stresses, there is no magic tool. Mm -hmm. I would think that the only magic tool that we have is to reveal the rugby player in all of us. <laughs> okay. What I want to say is that we need to all work together. I will give a very concrete example of something that we have done at EU level at the time of the EU, EU crisis. We have the cohesion policy with uh, uh, FEDER, uh, my uh, acronyms in English are not in the right uh, order. Huh? So FEDER is for investment, and then we have FSC, uh, ESF, which is for on social issues. We have allowed ISFE, ESF to go direct to the citizens. It's the first time ever in the history of uh, the European Union that through a push of the European Parliament, European Parliament we have done that. And in the region sud, because cohesion policy is managed by the regional authorities, in the region sud, Renault Muselier has launch, just launched a 250 euro check mm. out of ESF for the more fragile citizens of region sud. And I think that's the way we need to work together. Look at all the tools that exist not the ones that we have to create, because the time to create them, uh, uh, the damage will already be done in the families. So uh, existing tools and make sure that through a new dialogue uh, between uh, politicians, be them European, national or local level, and also uh, private companies, supermarkets, but also farmers associations, we manage to deliver on concrete solutions on uh, the food affordability uh, crisis. I would like to put a little more time on the subject of the farmers. F uh, farmers, they give their last overs. We have a, an organization in France that gives uh, fresh food, vegetables, and, and what are, is not uh, sellable because it doesn't meet the criteria for the, the customers or because the market is not there. That's good, but we need to make sure that we give more power to them. For instance, uh, there is uh, the issue of money on charity banks, so that's a vote 
in the MFF, in the budget, but then also we can just work very simply on the best before dates so that it's easy to understand for all the food banks, all the supermarkets, all the shops, and that on an everyday basis, the things that can be given are given. On the food affordability crisis, some of us can pay, some of us can't. Yes. We must concentrate on delivering on the ones that can't at the moment, and at the same time, build on having a more resilient as agriculture uh, on all the subjects, work on food waste, which is a, 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 a real issue, and also accompany uh, uh, initiatives that bring uh, good value to the consumer, to the environment, and to the farmer. In France, we have Sekil Patron, which is on an everyday basis. They work with consumers on what sort of price are you ready to uh, pay for the milk? And there was a, a, a vote with uh, consumers on, we want a milk with a, a cow, so many cows per hectare, eating a, a this sort of herb and having, an, and so this has a price. And the consumers that created the product Sekil Patron milk agreed to pay the price. And then Sekil Patron went to see the supermarkets, and now Sekil Patron is everywhere. And as a consumer, when I buy Sekil Patron, I know that the farmer has got the good price. It's very important that we improve uh, the, 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 the sales of the good products made in Europe because otherwise, I would not like that the solution to the food affordability problems we have are imports from uh, uh, countries outside of the EU that do not respect our environmental, social, or whatever standards. Yeah. And we would create a Europe where we have good citizens that play by the rules, and then bad citizens that uh, buy uh, uh, the bad food and are responsible for the uh, climate change and do not help uh, Ukraine. So it's important mm -hmm. that we work all together. I understand. Thank you for that um, intervention. I think, um, I think we're getting towards a, a point that Gabriella would be interested in speaking on. We're, talking, we're in an adverse macroeconomic environment, right? But there are certain things that you can do within that setting, which is shorten your supply chains, you know, buy uh, from local producers, you know, introduce innovative pricing models, which maybe cut out the middle uh, yeah. or the intermediary and ensure that the producer gets a, 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 better, a better result. I mean, could you speak to what you're um, doing on that front uh, in your own business operation uh, in, uh, in Hungary, uh, Gabriela? Just to continue what, what Irina already began for us, it's extremely important to buy as much locally as possible. More than 90% of our suppliers are, are coming actually uh, out of, of Hungary, uh, and we, we really try to focus on that. And Hungary is a, is a small country, we are only 10 million people, so there are not, not big regions like in France, but still we started to cooperate with SMEs on the, this really local 40, 50 kilometer radius uh, to bring only those stores which are there. So we really look at this regionally, how can we do that? Because we obviously take out transportation costs, we take out intermediary costs, so that's, that's extremely extremely important, but you also have, have to see, see it on, on that level uh, that these are still uh, the products which are a bit on the, on the higher price level. Uh, because in, in small quantities you can just uh, be not that efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I believe that our responsibility is to be a really hard negotiator. Uh, and go back to the industry and stop price increases as, as much as possible. And probably the discussion within the EU was a dif different five or six years ago when we were speaking about UTP and how to protect suppliers. I believe it's, it, it's time to, uh, to see that we as retailers have also our positive sides and that uh, at a tough supplier discussion has a good effect on, on inflation because that's, uh, that, that's our role in keeping inflation 
in check. Is it, isn't it true to say that um, big food is um, doing quite well in this, um, you know, yeah. the, uh, in this, um, in this inflationary mm -hmm. crisis, but uh, retailers are finding it uh, to be a more painful yeah. experience? But what 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 needs to happen there to to redress I, the balance? I, I just uh, simply analyze the PNS of the <laughs> of the Hungarian market because okay. you know facts and figures are something which I like. Uh, so basically, in ha in Hungary, the food retailers dropped their profitability from approximately 3% to less than 1% on average, whereas all our suppliers have increased their uh, uh, profits by more than 3 percentage points, so from 3 to almost 6 percentage points. So basically, we've seen that this inflation had a big plus side on the, uh, on, on the supplier PNS. And I know that it was basically caused also from fear because no one knew what the energy prices are and, and simply just said, OK, they had uh, calculated a worst case scenario. Uh, and it has to be also critical to, to ourselves. We have expect, uh, accepted that, that price increases, but that, that has somehow to stop. But to be very frank with you, inflation will only go down when demand goes down. That's the simple, uh, simple economic role. And there where the points of Irene are extremely important, that with social measures we have to, to go directly to those people who really cannot afford and those people who were over-consuming, uh, that should stop. But that's a very difficult uh, challenge and we have only our, our social networks and uh, to have those people who are really suffering. I mean, another efficiency is obviously how you deal with um, food waste. There is issues around packaging. Uh, how, how, how would staying with you, Gabriella? Uh, I think obviously there's. Um, I, I think you probably have some common common views on uh, <laughs> on food waste. You might diverge uh, um, between the policy so politics side and the business side on on packaging. How how, how do those two aspects um, play out for you, um, Gabriella? Um, so packaging. Packaging is, uh, we have new rules. I don't know when they did come in place. Irene knows probably better than me. But what, what my topic would be, yes, packaging is something we have to reuse. It's extremely important. It costs money. It uh, harms the environment. But we have to be careful what we do because uh, uh, we shouldn't uh, put more inflation on, on the market. One, my favorite topic is refilling stations, which is a very nice and very very modern thing, people say, but actually, to be frank, we have known that business model for years and somehow it was not uh, developing on the market as quickly as everyone thought and that has a, a rational reason behind that because it's absolutely inefficient. Uh, uh, First, if I'm speaking to farmers or suppliers, I say that if we have refill station in the supermarket, it means that we will re reduce our assortment very dramatically because, you know, these bugs, uh, in this box, at, uh, we, we would have currently 15 to 20 products uh, where you should only put one container. So someone will lose. Uh, someone will lose because probably we will sell two types of rice and not 20 types of rice because we simply have not the, the space for that. Someone will lose on the price uh, because we will have higher operational costs and we will have to invest that. You have to clean that. Uh, the staff will have to refill that. And third, and most importantly, I, I don't believe that we will have less waste because uh, uh, if you consider yourself or your shopping behavior, your own shopping behavior, and you are self-critical, how many times do you stick to your uh, shopping list and how many times do, uh, <laughs> do you really prepare yourself? Will you take five containers with you? And you, will you exactly buy the five products or do you have a different shopping behavior? And if you do have a different shopping behavior, you will get or buy, depending on the financial model, the packaging at the store. Because that one kilo of rice you will have to take home somehow. Mm -hmm. And mo in most of the cases, you will not have your container with you. And I'm speaking of about the, uh, f out of experience because we have uh, experienced with this model because we want it to be very eco-friendly and everything. And, and, and we are currently in the process of demolishing this uh, refill station in the 30 stores where we have put them in because it was not accepted by the consumer. Great. I mean, Irene, if you could pick up on all these uh, issues around Essentially, efficiency and, and minimizing waste and the trade-offs around, uh, around uh, packaging that preserves food well but causes a 
causes a problem with um, with, with, with with packaging waste. Uh, <laughs> is, is the policy you know framework kind of about right? I mean, what would you like to see done differently? Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, I do not work on uh, packaging waste. Uh, okay. uh, it's a friend from Euronew that is a rapporteur. Okay. Uh, I used to be uh, a mayor of a small village, and so I do know that uh, uh, the key success factor is uh, packaging waste, is the way we collect the waste, and as it happens, it's a local competence and not... Uh, national mm -hmm. competence. So uh, the effectivity of uh, Brussels-led uh, piece of legislation uh, that does not uh, take into account how the main thing will be done because it's out of its scope uh, makes me wonder a little right. bit. So, uh, and the risk is that if we are not pragmatic and not efficient, it will be an uh, increase of costs. So uh, I am nonplussed at that, and I hope that the Parliament uh, becomes a genius and uh, amends and, and, and brings us solutions. Uh, and of course, we need to uh, have less uh, uh, packaging and recycle more. We all agree on that. Then the big discussion is how. However, I would not like any European policy to be done uh, uh, against farmers. <laughs> Contrarily to the US, the average salary of farmers in Europe is below the average salary of the uh, citizens. In the US, it's above. We have a big generation renewal uh, that is in front of us, and I would like to say hello to the president of CEJA that is in the room, because he is our future, is the future of the fact that we co keep on eating good local products that are our culture. There is more than food. It's our identity that is uh, uh, behind that. So until we have the average level of farmers uh, above the average level of citizens, we should make sure that whatever piece of legislation we put, mm -hmm. we do not endanger any uh, uh, turnover or avenue of farmers. And there are things like uh, uh, killing uh, the packaging for fruits and vegetables for less than uh, 1.5 kilos. I don't know if many of us in the room buy at one time, more than 1.5 kilo of strawberries. No one. And <laughs> of course, if you put uh, one kilo of strawberry in a paper bag, you are going to have a big problem when you reach the cashier because it will, uh, uh, it will not work. Uh, and so <laughs> if we have these problems, what will happen? Delivery problems from the farmer to uh, the supermarkets. And these will lead to increase of price and decrease of turnover for the farmers. So it's very important that we keep uh, on our scope that any piece of legislation that uh, uh, has consequences on food mm -hmm. should take into account that it improves the revenue of farmers. Message received loud and clear. Uh, Giacomo, I, would you like to respond? I think there's some, some broad points essentially around uh, issues of uh, uh, e efficiency in the, in the, in the, in the uh, food retail chain, uh, whether this is best addressed locally uh, or, and what should be done at a high level, at the level that uh, the, the Commission is operating and the EU institutions. Yes, well, uh, thank you. I, I think I can build, uh, I would say, relatively easily on, on, on the points that were very, I would say, wisely uh, put forward uh, by the two other, uh, the, the two other speakers. Uh, first of all, in terms of legislation, now, OK, I, I, I'm not, uh, you know, in, in the hands neither, but uh, of course, we have been following very closely in my service the, the packaging legislation. I know it's undergoing I would say a quite, uh, let me say, lively co-decision co -decision process. But uh, uh, I think that the key uh, comment I would like to offer there uh, uh, has been already, in fact, uh, mentioned by, 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 by the two speakers. So it's really across the whole value chains that we can uh, work together for prevention and reduction of food loss and, and food waste. So... Once again, let me take the example that uh, I, I can know better, which is uh, one of the aspirational objectives in the Code of Conduct that precisely addresses uh, this point. 
I, I think that uh, you know we we are suggesting to act uh, uh, jointly. Firstly, uh, uh, you know, supporting improve improve the food management uh, at uh, household level to empower consumers uh, to reduce and prevent uh, food waste. Uh, uh, you know, it goes also through, for example, promoting more mindful buying. Uh, providing a range of portions, serving and packaging sizes to cater for different lifestyles, uh, to optimize and develop uh, innovative solutions in relation to packaging and, and ingredients to prevent uh, food waste. So we can act both at, 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 I would say, at the household or consumer level, mm -hmm. or really all along, uh, you know, uh, and, and counting on the, on the collaboration uh, of all the operators across the value chain. For example, to identify and implement measures to improve the material efficiency of the processes, uh, you know, uh, and then, uh, for example, to prioritize redistribution of food surpluses to people in need, the example that uh, the member of, of the parliament was mentioning uh, before, uh, to optimize the use of raw materials through valorization uh, and, uh, of course, to raise awareness and mobilize resources, including on circular and bio-based uh, economy, investing also in skills and training. So uh, all elements, and these are just examples, that, yeah. you know, shall uh, ultimately improve the collaboration along the food supply chain uh, to minimize food, food losses and waste. One last thing uh, from a regulator point of view, you know, I have a long experience of regulation, although um, I, I am in the comfortable position, I must say that my service uh, within the commission is not responsible for any specific regulatory measures on agrofood, but it's clear, and this uh, I'm sure it's not a new, uh, a, a new element, uh, but well known uh, to all, and I think largely also to the audience. I think that when it comes to uh, legislation, when it comes to uh, regulation, we have to keep in mind, of course, the overall impact uh, of legislation, uh, you know, all across the value chain. And when producing legislation, being it for uh, packaging, uh, being it for, uh, you know, labeling, uh, being it for uh, 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 other aspects that are impacting the agrofood uh, uh, ecosystem, we have to be mindful and starting from the Commission, of course, to make uh, a special effort in order to well assess, I would say, the cumulative effect uh, of of these measures on the on the users, uh, which are certainly business on one hand, uh, farmers, mm -hmm. uh, which are uh, consumers ultimately. So I think this remains nothing new, but uh, this remains, I think, a very important, very very important element to be always kept uh, in mind. Thank you. Uh, our time's gradually drawing to a close, so I'd like to put a last question out to, um, to the panel. Um, with a request for, for brief answers. You know, we're, we're counting down to the end of this parliament's term. We have this ele elections coming up, uh, the backdrop of an inflationary environment and the food affordability crisis is obviously going to weigh on voter sentiment. We're seeing this already in, uh, in elections that are happening now. Um, you know, uh, Irene, if I might ask you first, you know, what are the, uh, and we also have a new commission coming soon as well. You know, what is the most pressing task that you see for uh, between now and, um, and 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 election time on the subject in hand, you know, making food affordable, good for food affordable and sustainable for for, for ordinary people, ordinary Europeans. Uh, the, the the most uh, uh, pressing task uh, is uh, that uh, we manage to have a dialogue uh, with all the stakeholders, uh, like uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, said it in her State of the Union. So okay. do that we get out of this parallel things where we have uh, inside the uh, uh, European Commission various uh, uh, directorates, inside the European uh, Parliament, uh, uh, various uh, uh, committees, and uh, after that, national and local authorities that all have different tools. We need to deliver with also a good partnership with the, the private uh, uh, sector. We need also uh, to 
realize that uh, it's our common living that is at stake, so that it's not just an economical problem, it's an environmental, uh, uh, it's who we are, what we eat, so uh, it's important that uh, we play by the rules and we uh, take it uh, in a fair way, because sometimes it's not spa, but some super supermarkets uh, do not play uh, good. Huh? <laughs> uh, uh, and then I must admit, uh, I would like to say the, to the Commission that I'm quite sad that some pieces of legislation have been postponed. Because how do you want the citizens to have credibility in us? In we put the Green Deal, we put the Farm to Fork strategy, we agree on objectives, and then you have a sustainable, sustainable food system. <laughs> Uh, animal yes, welfare. Yes, well, quite. Uh, uh, and so uh, we work, we work, we work, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, 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 com the commission did a, a package on, uh, um, on, on uh, the fi for 55. Why didn't it do a package on all the f food sustainability uh, uh, text? Because, of course, uh, the, 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 the people that are for animal welfare, we say, okay. So now, because there is inflation, we don't care about animal welfare, well, no, it's not that. Bearing in mind the time, I'd like to yeah. put the, Sorry. that point Sorry. directly to Giacomo. Yeah. Um, maybe it's not your responsibility for all these policy points, but uh, what is still deliverable? Will we see the sustainable food systems uh, 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 measure? Will we see uh, anything on animal welfare? Or, or will, we, will we have to wait because we're running out of time? Well, so I will be very quick. I, 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 I largely um, understand uh, what, uh, what MEP Tolere has, has said. Huh? There, there have been a huge work, by the way, uh, of the Commission services to prepare. She mentioned sustainable food system. I would like to mention also the package on food information to consumers, uh, uh, animal welfare, of course, that was mentioned. So I think there that there are uh, political decisions to be taken at the higher uh, level, but let's be aware of one thing, that we have to deliver, of course, good pieces or to propose. In any case, this is the role of the Commission, to propose uh, good pieces of legislation, the strike, uh, we come back to the initial uh, you know, topic, main topic, the right balance between uh, you know, the objectives and, and, uh, uh, and, the, and the cost uh, that uh, this implies for all uh, stakeholders. So I think uh, you know th this is really the the big the big challenge even from now to the to the end of this uh, of this period to the political elections and uh, for this uh, for this commission in, in in 2024. But a lot of material is there. A lot of work has been undertaken. I think it will be now a, a matter of properly assessing what are uh, the best measures that can complete uh, the full picture uh, on the topics that we have just discussed uh, earlier on. Thank you. And Gabriella, with a request for a very brief answer, what is your biggest wish uh, for, the, for the last year before uh, we, we go into the election season or election time? Uh, if one thing could change for your business uh, on, the, on the topic in hand? Uh, I believe it, it, it would change if, uh, if we would all get a little bit calmer and work together on, on the issue to, to drop the prices a bit and that everyone in the chain would be on a, honest with themselves and with all the others uh, and look at the, the quickest way to, to reduce the inflation. Thank you so much. Well, uh, we're going to try and wrap, on t wrap up more or less on time. Thank you to our panellists in the room, Irene Tolleray and Gabriela Heisler, and to Giacomo in Brussels. Uh, really enjoyable session. I think a lot of work to do, a very adverse environment, but um, clearly there's a need for uh, joined up thinking and a collaborative approach to uh, mitigate some of the tougher, tougher, tougher consequences that are affecting consumers across Europe. So what is happening now? I've lost my place on my piece of paper. <laughs> we are now having a networking break. And uh, then my colleague Giorgio Liali will moderate the next session. Uh, that is about trade deals, keeping the blocks agriculture ahead of the game. And that will begin at five minutes past four. So thanks again and see you shortly. <laughs>